Welcome everybody. My name is Umar Waris, and I am honored to be joined here today with Matt Musselman and Rabbi Michael Lerner on another interview for the Ideals of Medicine interview series. Both Matt and I are recent class of 2020 graduates from medical school, and we're incoming interns as well. I myself have just recently graduated from the UC Davis School of Medicine and will be entering the Family Medicine Residency at Mercy Medical Center in Redding, California. Matt and I co-founded this organization, Ideals of Medicine, to reclaim the narrative of our profession, that we are, according to our oaths, meant to first and foremost serve our patients and not merely serve other systems and interests. We are speaking today in unprecedented times. A pandemic has ravaged our nation, causing above 100,000 deaths, mm -hmm. alongside a failed federal government and even healthcare response. Mm -hmm. Nationwide protests have also taken over our nation against racism and police brutality. And they have shaken our nation to confront both its past and present injustices. There can be no better time to discuss the ideals that are important to us and that we must strive to, not only as medical professionals, but also, and more importantly, as citizens. And we wanted to have a conversation series with those who have exemplified and fought for such ideals. With that said, we could think of few better people with the spiritual, social, and even message, medical message of healing uh, than Rabbi Michael Lerner. My, Matt, would you be so kind as to introduce Rabbi Lerner to our audience? Absolutely. Thank you for that, Umer. Uh, my name is Matt. I just graduated from Toro University in the class of 2020 as a physician and public health professional. And in a couple weeks, I'm starting residency along with Umer in family medicine. Uh, I'll be working at Natividad Medical Center in Salinas. And uh, without further ado, it's such a privilege and honor to introduce Rabbi Michael Lerner, who is a clinical psychologist, philosopher, and activist. He obtained a PhD in philosophy at UC Berkeley, as well as a PhD in clinical and social psychology at the Wright Institute. He is the editor of Tikkun Magazine, chair of the Interfaith Network of Spiritual Progressives, as well as the rabbi of Beit Tikkun, Synagogue Without Walls. And he has received many awards, including in 2019, the Humanitarian Award by the International Association of Sufism and Morehouse College's King Gandhi Award for his work on peace and nonviolence. And he has written 11 books, including two national bestsellers, and most recently, Revolutionary Love, a Political Manifesto to Heal and Transform the World. And so it's a great privilege and honor to welcome you onto Ideals of Medicine, Rabbi Michael. Uh, we like to start off with an icebreaker, uh, if you don't mind, just uh, sharing with some of our listeners, what is a book or a movie or a song uh, that you've enjoyed uh, that you'd like to recommend to our listeners? <clears throat> uh, well, of course, <clears throat> I have 12 books of my own, but that wouldn't be right to take the space to recommend my books. So um, I, I also want to recommend the, um, the book by uh, um, Peter Gable. Um, and uh, let's see if I can remember the name of it. Um, uh, it's a, Gable is a very brilliant um, right. teacher, thinker, and um, but, I'm going to take a second to, to do. I think I found it, Rabbi. It's the desire for mutual recognition. Is that right? Yes. Great. The desire for mutual recognition. Yeah. Very wonderful book. Thank um, you. Uh, so, yes, I recommend that one highly. I still have to read that one. Uh, thank you for that recommendation. Um, uh, beautiful. Umer, would you like to go ahead? Uh, certainly. Certainly. Uh, Thank you again, Rabbi Lerner, for joining us. Rabbi, you have such a wide expanse of experience and work 
in spirituality, in political activism, and even clinical psychology and medicine. What led you down the path uh, of being both a clinical psychologist and a rabbi and working in such a, such a wide, expansive area? <clears throat> well, actually, um, I, it's a long story. It's the story of my life, right? I'm 77 years old, so <clears throat> been around for a while. And uh, I started um, at about age 12, recognizing that there was something very screwed up in our society. And I wanted to change it in some way. <clears throat> I got to know that because my father was a judge and my mother was an aide to a US senator. And, um, uh, and I began to read the congressional record and the senator, um, actually started to call me up to talk about, while well, I was a teenager, about what I was reading because he said he's the only, I was the only person in New Jersey that he knew read the, the congressional record. And I was, um, uh, but I was increasingly aware that there was something deeply screwed up about the politics of the society. And I re really wanted to understand what that was. Um, well, um, I, after, uh, I couldn't find the answers in college. Um, <clears throat> had a great college education at Columbia University, but um, there was uh, very little in the way of social activism or social uh, understanding there amongst the faculty. And, um, and even the students were by and large uh, apathetic. Um, but when, um, when I came back uh, from my junior year abroad in uh, England, and then went to the March on Washington in 1963 that had been organized by Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and marched with him and uh, several hundred thousand others in that demonstration um, and listened to the speeches, I began to get an understanding that um, there was a pro uh, what the problem was or beginning to hint at the problem. So um, I went to graduate school at the University of California in Berkeley and um, arrived there just at the moment that the free speech movement was starting. And I got involved in that. And then um, with my roommate, Jerry Rubin, uh, who was, a, um, who was <clears throat> very focused on the war in Vietnam, we organized together and with some other people <clears throat> a teach-in against the war. <clears throat> and at that teach-in, there were many, many wonderful teachers uh, including um, a guy named Isaac Deutscher, who was a, um, uh, a theorist um, who um, pointed out that there was something completely mistaken in the way that um, uh, people who were, um, who were thinking about what was wrong with the war in Vietnam were thinking. Because they were thinking, oh, this is an accident. Some stupid leaders who've made a stupid mistakes and we can get out of it. And what Deutsche said over and over was um, illusion after illusion after illusion. You people are living in a world of illusion. And um, uh, you needed to understand the systemic nature of the particular things that are going wrong. And um, so that was opened me to a different level of uh, uh, understanding. Um, it turned out that at the same time, my mentor at the Jewish Theological Seminary, Abraham Joshua Heschel, um, uh, was uh, moving in the same kind of direction, beginning to understand that the war was uh, a product of a larger distortion in human reality. And part of that distortion was that the society didn't see human beings as embodiments of the sacred. Instead, looked at other human beings primarily from the standpoint of um, their use value to each of us. And so, um, uh, um, he taught that um, Jewish values required us to see other human beings as fundamentally valuable and that that was the point of saying in the book of Genesis, in the first chapter of Genesis, that human beings were made in the image of God. That is to say that we had some of the holiness that we attributed to the God was actually inside us. And w in particular, that God, um, the God that uh, was in us, was a force that made possible the transformation from that which is to that which ought to be. 
So to say you're created in the image of God really means that you have the capacity to align with other people to transform this world. So I had had it in two different ways from the movements and I became uh, chair of uh, a um, the radical organization on campus called the Students for Democratic Society and I was their, their president from 1966 to 68. But simultaneously um, learning from uh, Heschel, meeting him again several, uh, uh, he had mentored me throughout the first four, uh, first four years of the 60s, but then uh, here I was in California. But, um, but listening to people and, um, and I was resistant, very resistant to radical messages because um, uh, I was in a graduate program in, in, in philosophy originally. So and I got my first PhD in philosophy and, um, and I knew that my whole career was dependent on my ideas. And if my ideas got too radical, nobody's gonna want me. But, so I fought against these ideas um, as much as I could, but, um, but I also was, um, had enough integrity to follow the logic of the arguments. And I lost every argument with, uh, and began to realize that um, a deeper understanding of the society required an understanding of the systems of oppression that were rooted in capitalism and that um, required uh, some fundamental change in the society, not just ending the particular evils like, for example, the war in Vietnam, or even as I became involved with the Black Panther Party in 1968 and 69, um, because I had been elected the, um, to the leadership of the uh, of a party that was called the Peace and Freedom Party. Um, and I actually met with Martin Luther King uh, Jr. personally on a one-to-one -one, uh, a month before he was murdered by, um, by the racists in the society um, yeah. and, uh, and tried to convince him to accept our nomination for president. And he was thinking it over when he got murdered. Anyway, uh, um, so um, all of this opened me to, um, a radical understanding. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. That's enough about me, right? So, uh, a doc uh, or Rabbi Lerner, I feel your work, these experiences are worthy of a Pulitzer Prize winning biography at some point that I, would, I, I look forward to at some point reading and seeing it uh, come out. Uh, one of the questions that came to my mind as you were speaking was that you reading the congressional record, realizing the systemic issues of our society and wanting to be a part of the change, but you knew of others that were apathetic. How do you feel that you had developed that keenness to be involved and to learn more, whereas others uh, chose the route of apathy? If you could elaborate on that and your understanding of that through, throughout your work. Well, um, actually, my experience was a little different. I wasn't surrounded by apathy in the 60s. People, people were energized um, and uh, so energized that when I went to teach in my first big uh, appointment at the University of Washington in Seattle, um, by uh, the second uh, quarter that I was there, I had a thousand students in my, in my class classes, okay? I mean, I was uh, the most popular professor there in no time flat wow. um, and um, organized a demonstration against the war the, um, that turned out to be way bigger than anybody expected. Um, and um, that led to an indictment against me by the federal government. Um, it's another story that I don't know you wanna hear. So, but anyway, the short run is, is that, um, um, I was very aware of um, uh, a problem that was happening, which was that although people were, um, that there was a lot of people in the movement who were energized to wanna to do something, they also had a set of ideas that said, who are we? We're never gonna accomplish anything. And we've been involved by, the, by um, 1970 when I was, uh, um, first indicted and then sent to federal penitentiary um, for, um, and uh, I mean, it was only a few months and then I was, uh, then the, um, but I was under indictment for three years while um, um, 
until the until the charges were dropped. They had, they had no basis whatsoever. I mean, they were ludicrous, but they were very effective because they did what the government wanted, which was to dis destroy our um, movement because we were defending ourselves from these um, bogus charges, myself in, in the thing called the Seattle Seven, but others in other, other trials. Um, but in that period, I had started, um, I then started a, an organization called the New American Movement that eventually mer merged with the um, uh, Socialist Organizing Committee to create um, what is now um, uh, one of the larger socialist organizations. Um, but over, I was saying, we need to reach out to people in a broad way. And most people were saying, that's uh, impossible. The people are all apathetic or they're all, they don't care about anything or they only care about themselves. Um, we need, what we really need is just a place for ourselves to feel comfortable. And I was saying, no, we can reach out to people. People um, uh, are listening to us. We had started out with, um, uh, in the 60s, uh, in 1964, when I was first involved, with about 100,000 people. But by 1969, um, one of the major magazines, um, uh, a business magazine, did a survey and found that there were 12 million people who identified with the new left that was, I was part of. So um, I, it was amazing to me that there was this disconnect between what was actually um, the case and what people perceived as their own powerlessness. Mm -hmm. That led me to want to understand where that powerlessness came from and how to work with it. And eventually that led me to go back to graduate school to get a second PhD in clinical psychology. And, um, and, uh, and thereafter to create an organization called the Institute for Labor and Mental Health, which um, um, miraculously, I think, um, since I had just only recently been, had my charges dropped by the federal government, suddenly the federal government was giving, uh, gave me a, um, a major research grant to study the psychodynamics of working people in the, um, in, from work and family life and the interactions between these. And so I engaged in a, um, uh, I was the principal investigator of an NIMH study um, that, um, in which I learned that um, many of the people um, who were starting to move to the right politically were actually not agreeing with the right about its policies, but they were, that they were feeling terrible about themselves and, um, and the right was speaking to them uh, about, um, about their feeling terrible. Now, why were they feeling terrible? Well, what we learned was that they had bought the, um, the larger vision of a meritocratic society that is central to capitalism's justification of inequality. See, the, cap the capitalist world teaches us that um, income and wealth are distributed according to your merit. So if you work hard enough and you're smart enough, you will succeed. Now, this is a thought which is um, very uh, strongly accepted, first of all, by the ruling elites of the country, but even by the, the top 10 to 20 percent of income earners the pe um, who see the vast disparities in income between themselves and the 80 percent who are not doing so well. And, but they, um, they justify this to themselves by saying, well, we worked harder, okay? Um, and um, doctors are amongst, the, amongst a lot of uh, the group that does that, you know. I suffered so much in my internship uh, in medical school and then interns and then uh, I worked so many years. I deserve to have way more money than everybody else, right? So this is, uh, um, but um, the truth is that, that in the investigations that I did over the course of several, several years in this um, work for NIMH, I learned, first of all, that people were working just as hard as any, anybody, you know, and that they were just as smart, but they weren't being just as rewarded. And, that, that, and, and the reason why they weren't rebelling um, was because they had themselves imbibed in, from, from the earliest childhood in, in their public, public schools and then in, 
hearing it in the in the media all the time, uh, in every almost uh, in the television and in movies and so forth, that it's their own fault. Plus, we had pop psychology and pop religiosity, and both of them uh, were teaching the same uh, false narrative, namely. You create your own reality, and whatever happens in your life is a re is a function of your um, smarts and your uh, how hard you've worked. So if you so if your life isn't what you want it to be, you've got nobody to blame but yourself. Well, I had you know I I was astounded when I started to listen to the stories, and we actually I had um, interviews with or um, had groups with. Um, thousands of middle income working people. And we're hearing this self blaming story coming up over and over and over again. They had bought the, 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 the line, the self blaming line that you create your own reality. And therefore, if your reality isn't working for you, you've got nobody to blame but yourself. Right. That's so um, that's the false narrative of a meritocracy that, yes, that comes internalized as like a sense of failure and hopelessness about uh, one's own individual capabilities, as well as making a larger change in the society at large. And this creates tremendous pain in people's lives. And um, uh, <clears throat> most people don't wanna talk about this. They, um, they actually um, uh, try to hide their own self-blaming even from their friends and, uh, and their spouse or their family. They don't wanna share this because they feel that this is just gonna make others look at them as though there's something wrong with them. So most people don't talk about this. It took a lot of work to get people to feel safe enough to talk about it. But when they did talk about it, uh, when they opened up finally, um, we learned a huge amount that most um, political leaders and most healers don't really understand about the tremendous power of this self-blaming, the internalization of it, which then leads people to try to um, suppress their the pain. And how do they do that? Drugs, alcohol, um, or right-wing politics. Uh, that is, I mean, why right-wing politics? Because the right wing was clever. It understood some of this. And, and it said, um, you don't have to blame yourself because you're, if your life isn't working, if you're, if, if you're uh, feel, feeling bad about your life, it's because of the other, the demeaned other of the society. Now, this has been part of the discourse in capitalist societies, not just in America, but uh, in all capitalist societies for at least the past hundred years. In the first half of the 20th century in Europe, the primary demeaned other were the Jews. And so, um, so uh, the message of the right was, the reason why things aren't working here is because of the Jews. Uh, one reason why a lot of people came, a lot of Jews tried to move to the United States was because here, there was another demeaned other who was already getting the blame, namely African-Americans. And in the, our society, African-Americans became the primary demeaned other. Now, in the, the last 20 or 30 years, that has evolved so that it's now also um, feminists, um, almost all people of color, um, uh, liberals or progressives, um, uh, uh, immigrants, um, Muslims, um, and, um, and it's open. The, the, they're willing to expand it to anybody. But what, what the essence of, this, of the right wing's message is, don't blame yourself, blame these other groups who are doing this to you. Now, the, the problem with that is that there's no possible plausible relationship between why my relationship isn't going well and that there's some, a gay person, let's say, or some, uh, or, or some uh, lesbians or you know, living down the block or whatever. Right. There, um, but the Stay left, the, um, the, the left could only attack the idea. Um, they c it could attack the racism. It could attack the sexism. It could attack attack the homophobia or xenophobia or Islamophobia or anti-Semitism, but it couldn't speak to the underlying needs that were not being met and that were making people feel terrible. And um, so we get this um, 
Now, the, so one of the other things that I learned in this study was that a huge number of people had the experience of being in the, uh, the, uh, the liberal or progressive world and feeling demeaned there, disrespected there, put down there if they were working class people. Um, and particularly put down was their religion because um, uh, according to even the most recent uh, polls, 60% of Americans claim to go to church once, at least once a month. Now, it turns out that they're lying. It's not really true. They don't go to church, but that they want to be seen as somebody who goes to church means that they feel a great deal of respect for that institution, and they feel some validation from their religious life um, that they want to hold on to. Um, and the left and liberal and progressive world um, makes them feel put down and um, really uh, conveys a message that they're on a lower level of intellectual um, and emotional and, and psychological development if they could possibly believe any of that religious nonsense. So, oh, right, so right, this, right. this is a crazy, crazy uh, way of dealing with people, but it does have the consequence of pushing people away, but it doesn't heal the underlying pain that is, leads people to drugs or alcohol or to right-wing organ, organizations or to a lot of other forms of dysfunctional behavior. Right, right. So Rabbi Lerner, I think this is an excellent um, segue into uh, uh, our next question, if you don't mind. Um, Please. Because yeah. although we, you know- That was as, my 30 second. <laughs> that's the 30 second answer, right, right. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, although we're physicians, uh, and we often adopt uh, medical lens for thinking about issues related to social justice. And, uh, you know, in the context of today, where we are seeing uh, a national movement uprising against police violence, uh, we can observe how the health of the individual, like you're mentioning, is connected very uh, much so to the health of the society, and that the health of the society is often a reflection of the social and spiritual values. Um, and so uh, you've, you've said in the past that modern politics has focused on meeting the material needs of the people rather than the spiritual needs. And so we were hoping you could just comment on what exactly do you mean by these spiritual needs mm -hmm. and how can we meet them, especially right now in uh, the mm -hmm. setting of COVID-19 and police brutality and ongoing, uh, you know, uh, exploitation under capitalism. Mm -hmm. Well, um, there's um, <clears throat> a, a very deep need that people have to be seen and recognized and respected. And, um, and if you, uh, at this moment, we have a great upsurge of um, anger against the uh, violence that led to um, the murder of one African-American and actually the many, many African-Americans have been murdered every year by police. Um, and so there's a recognition that there's something wrong, but, um, but you need to go deeper than that to, um, to sustain that because um, to sustain that uh, recognition you need to have an understanding of um, what it is that makes people want to be racist in the first place. And um, so I've just talked a little bit about that, that the racism is a way of removing the feeling of inadequacy, but the liberal and progressive world um, responds to that on the level of racism is evil and you who are in racism or doing racist things are evil people. Now, this is um, not a smart strategy. Um, in, and uh, particularly when it's coupled with, uh, and you white people have so many privileges. Now, um, it may be true that for who um, the upper middle class um, uh, um, participants in these demonstrations, those dem people think that, the, um, that white people have all these privileges. But the truth of the matter is, is that there's a very large section of the American public that is struggling to just feed their families, um, that's struggling to have enough money to have maybe one or two of the goodies that are constantly being thrown at them in the media as, as what a normal family should have. 
and they don't have the money for it. They don't have the, the they don't get the income for it. And many people have to work two jobs to to and and or have two two earners in the family and nobody there to take care of the kids when they get home from school. There's a tremendous amount of pain in this society that we totally ignore, that we don't recognize. And because we don't recognize them, we turn around and talk about white skin privilege without recognizing that that white skin, skin has, um, does not um, work equally across the class divide um, that for a very large section of white people, um, yes, they may have bought into the, um, the notion that they were privileged, but they actually, their actual lives, they're not so privileged. Now, yes, there are a section of the white population, maybe everybody you'll ever meet, <laughs> you know, in your normal life who have some priv privileges by virtue of their whiteness, but those privileges are vastly off offset by the amount of, uh, in which they, um, they themselves find themselves in a society in which they can barely afford their health care. okay? In fact, um, huge numbers of people are in debt uh, for medical, for medical um, uh, procedures that they, that they didn't have any idea would cost so much and are way out of, uh, out of range with what they could afford. So without the healthcare, without a decent healthcare system, just at the level of um, uh, not charging, of having free healthcare, which almost every other uh, advanced industrial country has, um, without without that, um, their privilege of being able to to um, lord it over some uh, people of color and say we're in a higher place than you, you know, we've gotten all these privileges amount to nothing or amount to very, very, very little. So um, now it's true that they, they, at least they have the privilege of, of, of not getting killed on the street because they're of the color of their skin. Um, but that shouldn't be seen as a privilege. That should be seen as a right for every human being to have that. And, um, and instead of telling white people, hey, you're privileged, say, no, these people have, you know, deserve to have the same level of safety and security that you have, but that doesn't give you a privilege. That just is what it is to be a human being, to have, have the right to be on the, on the streets or wherever you are and not be assaulted by a, um, a gang of ruffians who, are, uh, who have been um, given the privilege of carrying guns and wearing a little shield to tell them that they have the right to kill whoever they want to kill and then make up some story about why it was legitimate. So, um, okay, so um, I, I think it's important um, to, to say one of the key spiritual needs is to be seen as an embodiment of the sacred. And this leads me to a central core of what I write about in the book, Revolutionary Love, a Political Manifesto to Heal and Transform the World. Um, by the way, that book, which just came out in uh, um, the fall of 2019, was endorsed by Keith Ellison. Now, Keith Ellison is the, the um, person who is the uh, Attorney General of the state of uh, Minnesota, who has just uh, decided to indict all four cops, not just the one who was the, you know, uh, who who was actively involved, um, but to indict all four cops in in Minneapolis, and who is going to be the lead, um, the the lead um, person in the lead uh, prosecutor in the case. Mm -hmm. um, so Keith Ellison writes about Tikkun, uh, about um, pardon me, about the the book um, uh, Revolutionary Love, and says. Um, this, the idea that's being put forward there, that we need a society um, that, as, that, as I put it, as, uh, that he cites, the caring society, a society with a new bottom line of caring. So to say that more fully, um, what I call for in, the, in this book is for a new bottom line in which instead of judging uh, corporations, government policies, as, uh, a whole variety of institutions, efficient, rational, and productive to the extent that they maximize money and power, okay, which is the bottom line of capitalist society. We need a new bottom line that says 
uh, that they should judge, we should judge um, uh, our corporations, our government policies, our, our, um, the judiciary, our healthcare policies, our, ed our educational policies, our cultural, um, cultural realities, um, efficient, rational, and productive to the extent that they maximize people's capacity to be loving and caring, kind and generous, ethically and environmentally sensitive, responding to other human beings as embodiments of the sacred, rather than seeing them simply in terms of what can I get from you? Will, they, will you help me get what I need in the world? But seeing them as valuable in and of themselves, even if they never deliver anything for you, okay? Mm -hmm. And similarly, uh, seeing the, the world, this, the earth on the one end and the universe on the other hand, as fundamentally valuable and deserving of a response of awe and wonder and radical amazement at the existence of this world and yeah. of this universe and also of the existence of us as conscious human beings. Now, as opposed to, for example, looking at the earth from the standpoint of, gee, I wonder if there's anything here I can turn into a commodity and sell. Okay, so this, this new bottom line, uh, love, caring, kindness, generosity, ethical, environmental sensitivity, awe and wonder at the universe and seeing other human beings as embodiments of the sacred. I just said that in a 20 second soundbite, so that in case you think that it's too, too long and people won't hear it. Okay, so um, uh, that new bottom line is uh, the key, I believe, to a transformed consciousness. Now let's, and then let's try to get that new bottom line operative in medicine, in a healthcare system as a whole, but in every other system as a whole. So that, I don't know if that, did that answer your? Absolutely. What? Yes. That did, that did, that did. Thank you so, so much, uh, Rabbi Lerner. Uh, uh, your point about this new bottom line and that being the, predominant paradigm by which we judge our actions, by which we uh, take any action, I think is so profound within, particularly within our own healthcare system. It's sad to say that the profession so often, uh, whose entire foundation is care for the sick. Uh, it, it's unfortunate that, that it doesn't even, it, it doesn't even have that bottom line at times. Uh, and this brings the next question, uh, Rabbi Lerner, and that is that one of your uh, famous sayings is that people of all faiths need to shape a political and social movement that reaffirms the most generous, peace-oriented, social justice, committed, and loving truths of the spiritual, spiritual heritage of the human race. Uh, and that was a view that I've also heard from Michelle Alexander, who is the author of The New Jim Crow, uh, who also wrote that uh, we need such a coalition, a multi-faith, a multi-ethnic coalition to achieve a, revolutions, a revolution of conscience uh, and address racial and social injustice. Uh, in your work, uh, Rabbi Lerner, and I know that you have referenced this earlier in the interview as well, and maybe you can elaborate on it, that how do we be, build such a multi-faith, multi-ethnic coalition uh, that can achieve such a revolution of conscience? Hmm. Well, um, okay. Now, it, I tried in this book, to, in Revolutionary Love, to go through many, many steps along the way um, because the first thing that has to be changed is the ethos of the left, of the liberal and progressive world, because um, the liberal and progressive world looks at everybody who's not with us as though they are stupid or evil. And um, that, instead of what pe people are hoping for and looking for, is some affirmation of their humanity. And instead, um, we approach people, and that's part of, part of that uh, mistaken way of talking about uh, white skin privilege. Um, we approach people as though if they're not yet with us, they are screwed up and uh, uh, in some way less than. So, so how do we change that in the liberal and progressive world? I mean, this is critical, I mean, in many, many levels. 
uh, when you interview people, uh, we've interviewed people, and many others have interviewed people after the 2016 election um, about why they voted for Trump and very or why they didn't bother to vote at all. And the answer that we get often is some version of, um, I am not a, um, uh, um, a less than you. I am not a, um, a person that is, uh, as Hillary Clinton put it, and, and she was the candidate, she was uh, for the Democrat, so everybody who's not a, uh, in the liberal and progressive world thinks that she was speaking for the common understanding in the uh, liberal, uh, liberal and progressive world when she said, um, at least 50% of those who are not with us are a, a bundle of deplorables. Well, you'd be amazed at how many people even today continue to say, well, why am I not with the liberal and progressive world? Because I'm not a deplorable. And that's how they think, that's what they think we are. So, so um, step number one, for if you have any influence in the liberal and progressive world is to help tell people that they should be constantly saying in the public realm, we um, disavow ourselves, you know, we distance ourselves from what Hillary Clinton said. We don't see the people who are not with us as all deplorables. Yes, there are racists. Yes, there are sexists. Yes, there are homophobes. Yes, there are anti-Semites. Yes, there are xenophobes. Yes, there are Islamophobes. But that's some of the people who are not with us. But there are other people who are decent human beings and they have not heard us speaking about them in a respectful way. Now, how do you get that change to happen? Well, that's where um, our organization, the, um, the, um, re the organization of um, spiritual progressives um, offers trainings in how to speak empathically to people who are not yet with us. And to, um, but actually the first step it, with that empathy is to use it to go and speak to people in the liberal and progressive world to help them get over their um, legitimate anger at people who are not supporting um, supporting our ideas, but nevertheless, um, that anger keeps them from being heard. So the first thing is we need to build a compassionate left, a compassionate liberal and progressive force. And um, so, and that's where, um, and that's a one element of what a, a progressive medical organization could do, a progressive organization in the medical world, is to try to train doctors in empathy and caring for other people and understanding that that empathy isn't just about their, um, their presenting problem of, okay, I, you know, I have a, a ruptured something or other, or I, I, uh, I have, have some disease, but it has to, the empathy has to include the totality of people's lives. And that gets us to changes in the way the medical profession mm -hmm. operates because um, the medical profession has divided into um, uh, specialties that are very narrowly defined. And I know I've been tossed around from one after another to another of the different specialties to try to understand problem X or problem Y or problem Z. Um, and um, we need to have a medical profession that is reorganized in a different way. But I'm saying that the, the more general point is we need to not only um, understand how to talk empathically, but to actually be empathic, which is <laughs> different than just talking the game. It means being empathic means that when we see some irrational behavior, that we not say, oh, well, then this is a, an irrational person, but instead ask, what is it in their life that leads people to buy into things that actually are not in their long-term interests? Um, for example, Trump, for example, right now, the Republican Party as a whole. Why would people um, who are, I mean, it's one thing to say, ask why people in the top 10% of income and wealth earners are, are, are in that. It's another thing to ask why the bottom 80% of earners or wealth holders are, are still supporting um, uh, p politicians who actually vote against their, their, their interests. And so part of that problem is, as, as I said, it has to do with 
believing that they don't deserve, self-blaming, and then feeling that they uh, need that to be relieved. The liberal and progressive forces need to uh, help people relieve that self-blaming and instead treat other people as though they are fundamentally valuable and not as, as though they are fools or they are ben beneficiaries of racism and sexism and homophobia and wh whatever. Um, but to see, oh, there's a system operating here. And it's not just a system in terms of the distribution of money. It's, in, it's, a, it's a system in the distribution of love and caring and kindness and generosity and respect. And so we need to build that right into the practice of medicine, into the practice of psych, uh, psychiatry, of psychology, um, but also into every other part of the professions where you have liberals uh, and progressives who are there, but they're, they're teaching about how bad Americans are instead of seeing, no, most Americans aren't bad, but some have been led to support very evil forces. Why, what's happening? To ask at that level is the start of a strategy to build a different kind of movement and different kind of world. Amazing, Doctor uh, Rabbi Lerner. Uh, amazing, and um, this this need to uh, incorporate uh, fundamental empathy into our systems and our training and our education systems, and um, and a common understanding of the uh, the inherent sacred nature of every human being is, is, is uh, what I'm hearing. And I just want to, uh, and, and you've mentioned a little bit about, um, you know, transformation that we need to make in the healthcare system uh, as well. And so I just wanted to, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, shift the conversation towards that a little more. Um, and, you know, in, in, uh, in this time of a uh, global pandemic specifically, it would, uh, we'd like to just invite you to comment briefly on um, the, the healthcare system in general and, and how do you feel that our healthcare system has responded to COVID? Well, first of all, I'd say um, that there's, that the medical system has shown a lot of caring. It's not, um, uh, and a lot of people have risked their lives to go into hospitals and uh, or work with people who are in danger uh, or who are suffering from COVID. So I want to, on the one hand, I don't want to put down the, everybody in the profession at this, this moment. On the other hand, they work within a system and the system is one in which um, many people don't go, don't even go when they have the symptoms, don't go to the hospital because they know that it's going to cost more than they can afford. Or others who have gone and then come away um, having uh, been on a, um, uh, on a, uh, um, a breathing machine of some sort or other, and then they come out and they have a $50,000 bill waiting for them. You know, I mean, uh, so um, the system is... Um, very screwed up in, in, in that obvious way uh, that we need a healthcare system that is free for everyone, or at least free for everyone who's making less than the, the you know, less than uh, a few hundred thousand dollars a year. <laughs> it should be free for, uh, I don't know that it has to be free for the millionaires, but it should be free for everybody else. Um, but that's only one dimension, okay? because the healthcare system as a whole has deeper problems. And here, uh, I just wanna mention one, that um, if we're looking for a vision of a different kind of healthcare system, uh, a, a healthcare system that really recognizes human beings as embodiments of the sacred, then we need to reconfigure what, what that healthcare system is about because um, the pain in people's lives that leads to uh, various forms of um, self-destructive behavior or other destructive behavior um, uh, is something that is, needs to be addressed simultaneously with whatever specific thing people have. In other words, another way of putting this is we need to not think of um, people when they come into our uh, medical system as um, um, where do I find the particular you know, where's the bug? Where's the, 
where's the cancer? Where's the, the, the thing? And then cut it out in some, some way. We need to treat human beings as human beings, which is to say, as uh, integrated physical, spiritual, and intellectual reality. And so the healthcare system needs to be built on the sense, on, on the, a different paradigm. The paradigm is we're treating a human being, not simply a tiny little bit of that human being, okay? We're treating a human being and, um, and to treat that human being means to understand the full complexity of their life situation. So the intake, it can't just be about, well, did you have this? I, I mean, I just recently filled out a form, okay? Here are, here are 40 different ailments that you might, you know, you, have you ever had this one, this one, this one, this one? No, 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 no. Okay, so, but th they're not asking about me. They're asking about me as though I'm a body, but I'm more than a body. I'm a human being. I have other dimensions and the other dimensions interact with the level of my health. So we, so we really need a healthcare system that is addressing the full level of human beings. Now that's, that means that the healthcare training has to be different. It has to be, um, it has to include the psychological and spiritual dimensions of human needs and people, doctors and nurses and uh, and uh, every form of healthcare professional needs to be uh, taught about the totality of what it is to be a human being and the various ways that all these, inter these levels interact with each other so that a psychological pain, a spiritual pain has reflection in the body. It's not just that, the, uh, it's not just that we're finding some particular um, germ or some particular um, other evil that is, now we've got to look at how the totality of their life situation has um, produced um, whatever it is that we need to, to work with. And similarly, when we're working with whatever it is that we're trying to work with, we have to continually be affirming the humanity of the, the being that we're working with and strengthen the, their spiritual resources, their um, their psychological resources, as well as their physical resources. So um, it's not enough to say, now go exercise. Yes, exercise also, but also here's, here's what you can do to better take care of your health at a spiritual level and a psychological level and so forth. Now, this is a huge transformation of what medical uh, training would be, um, but it's absolutely necessary. Um, and and then the medical system has to be a medical, psychological, and spiritual system, a system that, tr that treats the whole human being, not just the particulars. And there we get into, um, uh, again, it turns out that there's um, a money issue here because um, it's uh, easier to try to find the quick fix and you send somebody out at, uh, of the doctor's office and they found some quick fix, but you haven't dealt with the totality of things that, that, that are um, causing sickness, that are causing lack of health, okay? So health care means caring about the other human being and not, not as, for example, now I'm on a thing called medical one. So I gotta see my doctor and, um, uh, he, he complains to me, why? Because I have too many problems. Does he, she shouldn't bring so many problems to me. Well, they're all officially medical problems, okay? But he says, I only have 15 minutes to see you. <laughs> you know? So um, yeah, so there is something about the, 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 the way that the system is set up in terms of the money problem. Then there's also the problem of, well, what if everybody went, if, if it were free, everybody would go see the doctors all the time and they'd be overloaded, there wouldn't be enough time. Well, yeah, that's, but that's all, that is a reasonable concern and it needs, needs to be met by having a massive, um, massive uh, extension, uh, expansion of medical training so that, uh, that we have three or four times as many um, doctors, nurses, and all the other levels of, of, of psychologists, psychiatrists, et cetera, as we have now. Um, we could do that. We could train lots and lots more people would like to be 
doctors or, or uh, particularly if, if it were in a context of a system that was a caring, uh, a caring healthcare system rather than a money-driven uh, healthcare system. Now, some of the people at the top are gonna, of, of the medical system are say, hey, wait a second, I work so hard, I deserve more money than everybody else and so forth. Um, okay, if you need to resign and go into some other field, go do that. There are a lot of other people who are smart enough to be, to be doctors, okay? Um, they may not be so good at memorizing um, the, um, the chemical, um, uh, the, 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 um, the information you need to pass the um, chem, you know, um, whatever the course is. The cycle is the classic uh, uh, example. The Krebs cycle is a biochemical pathway. Yeah, that exactly. Tested on you may not always family. be able to memorize that, but you know what? You don't have to memorize it. Yeah, we've got to, got to, we're living in a world where there's a, um, easy access to remind the doctors what, what they need, what they were told they had to be able to memorize in order to pass the test. Okay, so... Um, what we need is to see if they can pass a test uh, on, on not uh, a human in a human encounter with how to show caring and, gen and genuine caring and how to not go into medicine for the for the potential of getting more money than any other profession that they can think of that they could get into. Okay, so that means we have to change the whole system, the larger system of capitalism. We have to build a system based on, on the new bottom line. And, um, and that's a big jump for an organization like yours starting out. You don't want to position yourself in a way that makes it sound like, um, oh, you're so unrealistic. But the truth of the matter is, is that people never know what is um, possible until they struggle for what's desirable. And your organization would do a great service if you would not be so realistic. I'm not saying you are. I'm saying that 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 to not don't be realistic. Don't 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 let what the people who have power tell you is possible to define what you put forward as desirable. Instead, go for your own vision of the highest possible vision of the good, and make that ingredient in what you uh, what your organization is talking about. And yeah. although many people will dismiss it as impossible. It turns out that every major change that we've seen in the past 150 years in our world have happened because um, people who were initially uh, told that what they wanted was impossible and unrealistic, they kept on fighting for it. And if it was an idea that made sense, eventually it, re it got a bigger, much bigger um, support system and so and that so that's been true about the um, the civil rights movement about the women's movement about the struggle against apartheid in South Africa um, mm -hmm. and okay, all of those and many other uh, yeah. the right of um, gays and lesbians to marry and whatever all these struggles each one of them was built, was um, dismissed as unrealistic impossible not just by people with a lot of power but even by their friends and their neighbors, because um, because people have Im, uh, imbibed this what I call surplus powerlessness. That is, um, there is an, an inequality of power in the society for sure, but there's ideas that people have um, have brought into, uh, um, brought into, and then brought into uh, every discussion about what's possible in the world. The ideas that teach them that nothing really can change. But that's an illusion. Um, things can be changed radically, and they need to be changed radically. But you have to be able to go through the period of dismissal and being looked down upon as unrealistic for a while, because you never know what is actually possible until you fight for what is desirable. So uh, inspiring. So inspiring. And uh, 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 Rabbi Lerner, the name of our uh, project, our organization is Ideals of a Medicine uh, for that reason, because we are aspiring to those highest and most noble possibilities uh, and not allowing ourselves to be shackled to the present realities, which we know can be improved upon, which we know are not serving uh, many, many people. Uh, so thank you for reaffirming uh, the uh, the importance of maintaining that ideal vision uh, 
and sticking to it. And uh, this brings me to our next question is that unfortunately in medical school, we do not get much formal education in the history of our profession's role in leading or even uh, perhaps stopping social change, our pre profession being medicine. Uh, in fact, today, uh, that role of physicians being leaders of social change has not just been more than uh, just de-emphasized, it's also been ostracized many times. Yes. How do we reclaim the narrative of doctors as leaders of their community? And as Rudolf Vir Virchow once wrote, that doctors as the natural attorneys of the poor, how would you recommend we reclaim that narrative? I, I, I can't tell you um, how specifically, I can only say in general, you have to be um, uh, courageous in putting forward the notion, I think maybe you ought to stop saying doctors and start saying healers and healers. Um, because um, uh, the doctors need to be healers and doctors start out being healers. And we need, um, the, the, the word doctor has um, this implication of, uh, knowing more than other people and being in a higher place than other people. I say, um, say you're healers. You are um, doctors who are doctors who are healers. Um, okay. Um, and I think that what needs to happen there is that you need to go to all the, med every year to all the medical, um, various medical organizations and be there trying to get um, um, a, a table, um, eventually sessions that you can run there that put forward the ideas that, that your organization holds and let, uh, because you will find that there are some people even in those uh, often stiflingly um, boring and, uh, uh, um, and uh, um, narrow in their conception, there are nevertheless some people who can be your allies. The second thing I think I want to say is that the conception of a new bottom line and um, how that applies to medicine, you could put that into a little um, pamphlet that is given to everybody who comes to see you. And um, I can't ask that in the middle of a health uh, interview that I can ask that you show a lot of empathy, but I can't ask for you to give this whole talk in the middle of a medical interview. But what you can do is to have um, a pamphlet that's there um, that, you, uh, that you give to each patient to take home and read about a different, the different view of what medicine should be. And, um, um, and, and that you're part of that um, movement to try to make that happen and to encourage other um, doctors other healthcare professionals um, to have the same pamphlet that that um, puts forward this idea. So, so um, you protect yourself from the oh well you're indoctrinating your patients. No, we're just giving them this information about a worldview. We're not uh, when we're seeing the patient, we're not telling them that they have to agree with us. We're we're only saying uh, if you'd like to understand where we're coming from. Uh, please read this uh, this pamphlet. So, um, so go into the world, go into the public world like that. Um, go into um, then, um, uh, okay, like the um, at the Bernie event that that you I guess you were both at in in uh, were you both at it in uh, Richmond? Um, we were. We were. Yeah. So. I would have loved it if you had been giving out such a pamphlet to everybody who was there, okay? Because um, they're, all of those people are looking for something different. They want a different kind of medicine. So um, you might find that um, uh, people in private practice, for example, although I guess there are less and less such doctors in the world today, but um, that they would attract more people if they were putting forward a, this kind of a vision. Um, but in any event, uh, um, you might find all kinds of allies that you didn't know were there. Um, but you can also um, 
if, if you can raise the money to do this, send out a pamphlet like this to every, uh, every healthcare professional in the state of California to start with. Um, uh, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's not that much money to put it in the mail. Um, so anyway, these are a few things to think about. I, I don't, I, I can't, uh, you know, I'd, I'd have to have my feet more solidly grounded in the day-to-day -day reality that you're in to tell you more about it. But I'd say these are a few, a few things that, that you might be able to do. Thank you. Thank you for these concrete examples, actually. Uh, very helpful in our brainstorming about next steps um, for our organization. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for addressing uh, some of these ideals uh, and encouraging us to remain uh, or to become even more courageous in our uh, going out into the public and, uh, and empathic with our approach to medicine. Um, I wanted to ask a final question, um, given that both Umar and myself are about to begin that process of residency uh, as newly minted uh, uh, physicians and aspiring healers. Um, what advice do you have for us as we begin our intern year and uh, as we just embark on you know, the rest of our careers? Well, um, the first thing is articulate what you believe in. Articulate it to everybody you can, including your, your medical supervisors and everybody, everyone there. Let them know that you, you, know, that you have a worldview that you'd like um, them to think about. Um, number two, um, develop this pam pamphlet and give it, to, give it to people that you see. Um, Number three, um, give yourself um, sources of spiritual um, uh, rejuvenation. Um, so the, the Jewish idea is to have a Sabbath once, once a week. That may be impossible in some of your internships or, 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 your, um, or your residencies. It may be impossible to get that, but then create it some other time in the week. You need a time when you can get spiritual rejuvenation and take that as just as important as having lunch, you know, or having dinner, to have that spiritual re rejuvenation and um, invite others, other physicians to join you in that spiritual rejuvenation. Um, they, may, they may not be interested, but just um, if you talk to them in a respectful way and say, hey, you know, I'm doing this practice and I'd love to see you join me in it or I'd like to share it with you. Um, and, um, and this series of interviews that you're doing, share it with everybody that you're working with. Let them, let them also see this, mm -hmm. you know, and see the, this series of, um, of interviews and say, um, here, I promise you, you'll like this, please. Re you know, then if you can get them to read Revolutionary Love, that would make a big difference, I think, in a lot of people's consciousness, not because they'll agree with it, but because the, even having the idea that you can build a world based on love and kindness and generosity is something that they've never even heard anybody taking seriously. So they think that the left is all about um, redistribution of money. Well, that's part of it, that's important, but it's not the only thing. It's about redistribution of love and redistribution of caring. And um, when people hear that, they might be a lot more interested in, um, uh, in what your ideas are. Um, but of course, uh, don't, I'm not gonna be surprised if a lot of hard-headed um, people in the, in the profession who are supervising you are saying, ah, that's all silliness. You know, I thought you were a smart person. You got here from uh, UC Davis Medical Center, whatever, you know. I thought you were smart. Now you're listening to this stupidity. You can say, well, I'm sorry that you feel that way because I certainly do know all the things that, uh, that I've been taught so far in the medical profession, but there's another dimension to life that I take seriously and that a lot of our patients are likely taking seriously. And, um, 
it might make you more effective in some ways as well. So that's as best I can say. Uh, uh, Dr. Lerner, uh, excuse me, Rabbi Lerner, uh, we might as well uh, call you doctor because uh, you've been providing so much healing uh, uh, it, just through this conversation and we so much appreciate that and uh, Rabbi Lerner, uh, as we had shared earlier in our conversation that we so admire the work that you are doing currently and that you have done in the past. Uh, you are a role model to so many of us uh, in uh, living and fighting for the highest ideals, not only within certain sectors of our society, such as healthcare, but in society as a whole. And I think uh, you elaborated upon that message about that new bottom line, that new aim that we must be having, uh, seeing the sacredness of all human beings, seeing the wonder and the beauty of our universe, uh, and, uh, and valuing that uh, in everything that we do. And we so appreciate it. We hope Matt and I can continue that in the work that we go ahead and begin as medical professionals, as interns, residents, and future physicians and leaders. And we will be remembering your advice. And uh, we hope that all the people that will be watching this interview in the days to come will be similarly inspired as well. Uh, and we can't thank you enough for your time today, uh, Rabbi Lerner. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. And uh, let me say, um, the way to thank me best is to get you, you and your friends to read the book Revolutionary Love and to consider taking the training on uh, empathic uh, communication, um, or we call it uh, prophetic empathy, um, that is offered uh, by our um, at spiritualprogressives.org slash training. Uh, spiritualprogressives.org slash training. So thank you very much. We'll put a link to that below the video online. Great, thank you. wonderful. And many blessings to both of you. Thank and, you. And to your venture. Thank you so much, Rabbi Lerner. Great.